Hello and welcome to Rally Point. This is our monthly series where we focus on veteran service organizations that serve the veteran community uh, with a variety of programs and, and projects and opportunities for veterans or their families. Um, just as a reminder, my name is Colonel Retired Bill Butler. I'm the Chief of Staff here at the National Veterans Memorial Museum. Uh, this month, we're going to focus on a great program that is an outdoor activity. It's called Project Healing Waters, and it brings veterans to the great outdoors uh, to learn the art of fly fishing. Um, and you know, it allows them to navigate the journey after service, helps minimize some of the noise that might be going on um, or demons that they're wrestling with, and it also creates meaningful connections and provides opportunities for them. We think you'll find this uh, discussion helpful and inspiring. Uh, and if you're watching us on Facebook Live right now, add comments into the um, chat box and or questions that you might have or where you're joining us from. Uh, so we'll we'll dive right into it. Uh, so today I'm joined by uh, our two panel members, Jeff and Jared, both of whom are involved in Project Healing Waters, one at the local level and one at the regional level. Again, this is a nonprofit that serves veterans. Uh, Jeff is not a veteran, but he serves them with his volunteer work. Uh, so Jeff, if you could just please describe a little bit about yourself and uh, introduce yourself for the audience. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, Bill, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, present our organization. I know Jared and I are excited about uh, where, where this can go and uh, having that opportunity to kind of tell our story. Um, I'm an architect by trade. 43 years in the practice. I design hospitals and I've had worked on the VA. Actually, I'm working on a project at a VA where we have a program in Minneapolis. So I uh, was really ingrained in healthcare. And I think that interest in helping people indirectly with buildings uh, kind of translated itself into working directly with people through something else that I love a great deal, which is fly fishing. Uh, I'm semi-retired, so it gives me plenty of time to kind of work with Project Healing Waters. Uh, I started the North Chicago program about eight years ago as the education chair for Gary Borger chapter of uh, Trout Unlimited. I'm now the chapter president and um, uh, just turned over the reins of that back at the end of October or end of September rather. And, uh, but during that time, uh, I also became, I've been the Midwest Regional Coordinator for four years. Uh, I've sat on the board of trustees as the field advisory council chair and uh, I'm now a full-time board member as of October 1st. So I've worked at both the local levels and I take it all the way up to international. And it's a great organization. Uh, there's nothing, uh, it, it's a family. And really uh, what you talked about is really kind of reducing those demons. You know, we're really in the business of creating new memories through new experiences. And what I've always said is that I want our participants to remember the best part of their service, but not be haunted by the worst part. And we can replace that worst part with fishing and other focused activities. So that's kind okay. of, that's a little bit about me. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Jared, so Jared's a Marine Corps veteran. Uh, he continues to serve others uh, through his project Healing Waters work. So Jared, if you can you know, tell us a little about yourself, what you did as a Marine and uh, how long you're in that sort of thing. Yeah, certainly. Thanks for having us. Um, I was in the Marine Corps Reserves, actually, from 2005 to 2011, while uh, also attending The Ohio State University. Um, 2008, I was called to active duty and went to Iraq with Second Lab. Um, over there, I was essentially a truck driver, um, running security missions, uh, you know, whenever they told us to daily. And um, I've always fished my whole life, but when I came home from uh, Iraq, uh, I found myself needing a little bit more time on the water, and I found uh, peace and solace in doing it. Um, and so once I had taken care of myself and gotten my head right, um, I needed to find a program like Project Healing Waters that served veterans and got them out on the water and fishing. And uh, I was really called to duty to do this. And uh, back in 2019, um, I was asked to take the leadership role of the Columbus, Ohio program, and I jumped on it. Uh, unfortunately, a few months later, the world shut down, and it was a very challenging time. 
um, to say the least. Our program being an outdoor fishing program was not really designed to be done over the phone and over the internet, but we, uh, we made it through. And since uh, early 2021, I believe, we've been having two to three events a month uh, for the local veterans here in Columbus. And we've grown our program to about three dozen veterans and about four dozen volunteers. Great. Um, so for, I guess, uh, Jeff, this is probably better for you since you've been involved uh, longer. So can you just uh, tell us a little bit about um, the how and the why Project Healing Waters was founded? Sure. So uh, back in 2005, uh, Ed Nicholson, who was retired Navy, uh, was being treated at Walter Reed. And during his recovery, uh, there were a number of uh, post 9-11 veterans coming in and, and getting treated as well. And he noticed that they were depressed and he just kind of thought to himself, let's, let's get them outside. They, they got to do something. They're just sitting here moping. And um, so once Ed healed and was back out, uh, he, he recycled himself back into the hospital again as a volunteer. And he took a handful of guys out fly fishing. I think it was on a pond nearby. And he said, you know, it, it worked wonders. He could see the difference in people. And then, uh, and it was just by, by chance, he thought this would be the activity to do it with. He, well, he said, uh, he goes on to tell the story that each time he met, there were five more, and then there were five more, and then there were five more. Mm -hmm. And he said it got up to like 25, and he said, you know, this is real. We've got to do something about that. And uh, today we boast close to 240 programs uh, in 48, or 49 states of the union. The only one we don't have one in currently is Hawaii. Um, our numbers are about 4,700 veterans that are registered or participants that are registered in, um, in our organization. Uh, we don't account for the inpatients that we see. So those 4,700 are basically out people being treated on an outpatient basis. The number, the total number is probably close to 9,000. We're probably close to 4,800 uh, volunteers in the organization. It's all volunteer from the board all the way down. And it's, uh, uh, Basically, what we our, our central mission is to provide um, emotional and physical uh, support for uh, injuries that are seen or unseen in uh, our disabled veteran population. And so, do you find that the um, you know that emotional uh, and or physical support? Do you, do you find that is from the volunteers? Is it from the other veteran participants? Are they peer leaders, clinical social workers? Yeah, I think just when you get out of the military, you kind of just go back home and you don't have that support system around you. Um, Bill, obviously you retired from the military um, and, and you probably understand that part of it. I don't know how quickly you jumped on to the, the museum afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but for myself, you know, we came back home, there's 500 of us over there, especially as a reservist. I come back home and it's just you. And for me, it was a bunch of college students. And I didn't really have a support system that understood what I was going through. And so to be able to put on, you know, just a couple of events a, a month and to link people together that have similar interests and similar experiences um, where they might not be able to otherwise find them uh, organically is just extremely helpful. Okay. Yeah, the act of uh, the actual act of fly fishing itself has some therapeutic value. We've uh, seen that it tends to calm um, hypervigilance. Uh, it, the focus helps an awful lot. But I think what Jared is describing is that camaraderie or the ability to kind of reconnect with some bigger organization. And I think even though the fly fishing and all that is a medium by which it happens, the real the real magic happens when those connections between the volunteers, participant to participant, participant to volunteer. And it gets even more interesting when programs from different within regions or different regions get together and they have those shared experiences. You can really, as a, as a civilian, I can really see the, the connectivity. You can really sense the bond. It's a fraternity or sorority. Um, it's pretty powerful. Yeah, it's, um, you know, we, as part of our resilience and wellness program here at the museum, we provide uh, free jujitsu classes five days a week, free yoga mm -hmm. classes one day a week, but we're going to expand that. That's our newest um, line of effort for resilience and wellness. We also do some CrossFit workouts, um, normally the hero workouts associated mm -hmm. with Memorial Day, Veterans Day. 
uh, that sort of thing. And we, we find the same thing. You know, you're doing some sort of activity that requires you to focus on, you know, a yoga pose so you don't lose your balance or focus on a jujitsu move because you're sparring with somebody and you don't want to get choked out or arm barred. And it, it provides that same um, mm -hmm. uh, antidote. You know, so it, it's calming. And, and but the more important piece is it's providing connections with with other people with similar interests. And for our programs, uh, we welcome veterans and civilians. And uh, we, we find, uh, you know, a group that, you know, uh, here in a week, they're going to go to one of the Ohio State University wrestling matches and about 25 of us. And it's it's a mix civilians, family members, uh, yeah. veterans. And, it you know, it, it becomes almost kind of like that squad or platoon that you miss when you leave service. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned a little bit about um, uh, and so and some of the pictures you sent on the the diversity aspect of it in the women's program. Can you describe those a little bit? Because I, I think that's really important. Uh, this sure. year, it's not just a, a bunch of guys that look like the three of us, uh, but it's it's a variety of folks. Well, and you, you bring up a very interesting point because mm -hmm. uh, for a long time, fly fishing, fly angling has had this kind of mystique about it. Well, one, it can be a little complicated if you just jump into it. Um, but it was always uh, somewhat attuned to, to kind of middle-aged white guy, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what we've been finding over from the time that the movie A River Runs Through It came through, but again, there was been a resurgence during the pandemic to get outdoors. And I think we're seeing a large number. It was difficult to buy equipment. Everybody was running to the stores and buying everything. And so it was a little, little difficult for us. Uh, we have found that the age demographic of fly anglers is reduced and we're seeing a great number of women involved in it. Uh, we were, you know, we were listening closely to the demographics from the government as to when we would start to see the influx of females that had served coming in. And this, this past year, that number really rose. And we've kind of found that this is a very unique healing experience or post-traumatic growth experience. And so we have a number of different types of venues, whether they're local events uh, uh, where women, it's an all women's event, or we have something even at the national level with the Freedom Ranch for Heroes. And one of our other program leads was, you'll see that in the photos, uh, took a group of women out there from across the United States. It wasn't just from the Midwest, but um, there is a great mix. And I think it's wonderful to see that. Um, that it doesn't necessarily represent maybe the uh, demographic of Trout Unlimited, which I'm a member of, but I think it's beginning to show a really great demographic across uh, the military group groups and also as well to, with just the general population. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, can I add to that real quick? Yeah, please. Um, obviously, Jeff's at the national level. Here locally, we actually have a group called Ohio Women on the Fly, and uh, they serve women all over the state as a nonprofit fishing group, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. They're also under the Trout Unlimited Charter. And uh, we've got a couple of their key members as a couple of our volunteers here in Columbus. And we've closely partnered with them to try to expand our outreach to women veterans as well. And then, so I guess, you know, running a nonprofit is always, you know, you kind of live and die by the generosity of others. So what's your biggest challenge as a, you know, either at the national level, regional level, or here at the local level? I think it's growth. Um, you know, the numbers that I gave you a little bit earlier, the 4,000, 4,700, um, that represents a large number of Vietnam era veterans. And what we re really would like to do is see some growth in the post 9-11 groups. Uh, it's coming, uh, but it's coming slowly and you have to earn your growth. So uh, we're, we're really looking to continue to expand our uh, network of donors. You know, we are a not-for-profit. We're probably by government standards, a large not-for-profit, but we wanna be larger. And I think that's gonna be our biggest challenge really is to make sure that we can uh, that we can raise the funds necessary to get the kind of growth we want internal to programs and by expanding other additional programs. Okay, and then Jared, what about here at the, at the local level for you? Yeah, local is tough. I, it's such an, a niche group of individuals. You're looking for not just a disabled veteran, but a disabled veteran that wants to go fly fishing. So I can sit up at a fishing show and talk to hundreds of people and, you know, 
maybe one of them is interested in our program or even qualified. Mm -hmm. um, and, or I can go to a veterans outreach day and I can talk to hundreds of people and I have the same problem, you know, maybe only one or two people is interested. Um, so it just takes a lot of energy to expand a program that is just so individualized in yeah. uh, what we're trying to do, even though, you know, I, like I said, I'm a veteran, I, I fished my whole life. I, I love this aspect of it, but I guess uh, a lot of people think fly fishing is tough and you know, the beauty of this program is we're going to show you everything you need to do to be successful. And we're going to provide you all with all the materials. So if you're watching this and you're sitting there thinking, there's no way I could learn how to fly fish. There is a hundred percent some way you'd be able to learn how to fly fish. Like Amen. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I'm dumber than a box of rocks. Like if I can do it, darn near anybody can. A couple of years, well, I guess it was uh, probably four and a half years ago, five years ago. Uh, I was living in Italy as a Department of the Army civilian, and our son came over from college for part of the summer. And I'd always wanted to fly fish. I've never done it. You know, I, I grew up smallmouth bass, walleye, pike, um, uh, fishing, you know, here in the States and in Canada. And he's never gone fly fishing. So he came over. We went over to Slovenia, which we could drive to. is relatively easy to get to. And we hired a guide. And he, you know, he had all the equipment. He, he taught us everything we needed to know, how to, how to cast and how to reel, reel in, how to read the water. And we had a great time. And it was, um, I think, between the two of us, we caught about three dozen fish, I think 31 or 32. And Wow. Yeah, you know, they weren't any any whoppers like you have in your photos, but they, it was just a fun day on the water <laughs> with my son. And um, you know, if we could pick it up that that easily and that quickly, um, I'm sure anybody could. It was it was a really fun experience. So um, you talked qualifications, Jared. Can you describe those so people know? Yeah, they're. Uh pretty simple you just need to be um, service disabled veteran um, as you don't even have to have a, sp a specific uh, rating a zero That's rating great. will do um, additionally if you're doing inpatient at the VA you are eligible for our program during that time mm -hmm. um, and I think Jeff might be able to add to if he's got anything there no, that's that's exactly it. That's that's kind of what we're looking for. And veterans that are interested, uh, but don't are not being treated or don't have a service uh, rating, they can become volunteers because we do a good job of teaching the teacher as well. And I think it's one way. There's there's also that participation as a volunteer can help you as well. You know, you're you're getting some of the same benefits. And you know, Jared's a great example of somebody that went through. A healing process and is giving back and sometimes we have a, a good number i think 20 percent of our leaders in, in the organization and volunteers are people that were once participants okay and so we we have that path that path through the whole organization okay and then for the trips do are the um you know the the sponsorships and, and donations do they fully fund the trips or is a little bit you know, take it off the cost. How, how does that work? No, the so so the actual cost to the participant is always zero. Mm -hmm. um, we are fully funded in most cases. Uh, the way that the trips work at the national destination level, those are uh, fully funded by headquarters. Uh, at the regional level, we'll run a few trips. Those are fully funded by the region, and then the program programs uh, through their own individual efforts will raise some funds. But there's always uh, kind of a balance to that, you know, the core core program expenses like waiters and rods and all that stuff are paid for out mm -hmm. of a, out of a budget that's subsidized by headquarters. And then the overnight outing like hotel accommodations and things like that are paid for through the program, but they're all all through donations. And we do uh, we do a lot of social media uh, uh, fundraisers like Facebook fundraisers. We're one of the largest users of social media uh, in the United States as a not for profit. Okay. So if somebody wants to learn more about uh, the program or to find a chapter in their state or in their town, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, I would, I'd go to the website, www.projecthealingwatersflyfishing.org. And uh, I think that's a, it's a, it's a good way to connect. Uh, once you get into the website, you'll be able to find 
uh, the region. He'll be able to find a regional coordinator or even a program lead uh, right down to the program lead like Jared and love contact information. But the website will take you through a lot of really great information. We've got some videos and things that are there to watch that talk about some of the events that have gone on and testimonials as to how uh, there's been some great healing. And we've had great sponsors from Shell Oil and Ford Motor Company helping us put these uh, little video pieces together. Okay. And then you mentioned uh, healing a couple of times. Do you, are there testimonials or stories that you can share about somebody's experience and their either their post-traumatic growth or uh, sure. just how the program has impacted them in a positive way? Yeah, hey, Jared, go ahead with that one. <laughs> um, like I said, uh, when I introduced myself, um, I didn't necessarily find healing through Project Healing Waters, but I found healing through uh, being on the river and fishing a lot. Um, I was going through um, some grief counseling at the time and a little bit of PTSD counseling um, through the uh, vet center here in Columbus. And one of the things that got me out of my head was just fishing and being on the river and, and just fishing. That's all it was. And it became, it, it almost got to the scary part. You know, I was fishing like 60, 70 hours a week. Um, <laughs> but it was getting me out of the bar and it was, it was keeping me sober. So I guess it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, I have some of my veterans that have come to me and told me like, I'm really glad I found this, this program. Um, I didn't have an outreach. I didn't have someone to call if there was a problem. I didn't know that just, you know, catching a six inch bluegill would make me feel this much better about my day. Um, mm -hmm. When, oh my goodness, when Afghanistan collapsed a couple years ago, yeah. um, you know, where I was at in Iraq fell to uh, ISIS back in 2012, I want to say. Yeah. That was a really weird day in my head. Like, I, you, you just, you get a lot of thoughts about why did I do that? And uh, so when Afghanistan fell, I've got a handful of Afghanistan and Iraq vets in, in, in my group. And I just knew that they were going to need to fish that week. Um, so we didn't have anything planned. We threw something together in 48 hours said, come on out. It was one of our highest attended event events of the year. Um, we had, you know, we had a lot of people just talking that day. They weren't fishing much, but they were talking a lot just amongst themselves and mm -hmm. just getting out of their heads for a few hours. Um, and we actually had to make a phone call shout out to the colorado springs group one of my marine corps veterans in my group was just like petrified one of his guys that he was in Iraq, uh, afghanistan with the person who saved his life and they're now you know been best friends for years had essentially locked himself in in a in a camping trailer in the driveway wasn't talking to anybody wasn't taking phone calls you know wife and kids are in the house we don't know what the mental state of that individual is and we didn't have any way to reach them and we mm -hmm. actually uh, reached out to the colorado group to try to get somebody in touch with them just locally because he was a member of one of the colorado groups um and they actually had a, a va counselor on as a volunteer in their group and and they uh, helped us with not just trying to do outreach to uh, my Marine Corps veterans, you know, friend out in Colorado, but also just giving my friend or my participants the resources um, to try to understand what his role was in that, to understand that it wasn't his responsibility at this point, even though he was, you know, caring and, and, and worried you know, he had done essentially all the things he could do. I know, you know, 22 veterans a day is that magic number that everybody talks about. It's a terrible thing. We, you know, if, we, if you served in the last 15 years, you almost certainly know somebody, unfortunately, that has committed suicide. And um, to be able to be there in the moment for that individual um, was just something that I'll never forget. And we were put together because of this program. Yeah. Yeah, that statistic is um, shocking. And then when you do the, the math, 
and uh, look at the total statistics, it's it's uh, so tragic on so many levels. So the like, how often do you all meet? Is it once a month? Is it just during the trips? How, 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 or, or are they different depending on the you know, size of the program and the number of participants? Yeah, it, it, it depends on your location too, you know, being in uh, different climates. You know, the North, uh, typically what we, ex the expectation is we meet once a month, but there are programs that will literally meet once a week. Uh, and it's soup to nuts. It just depends on the program location and how, how they make those connections. Um, the particular program I ran in North Chicago, we met uh, twice a month uh, for six months during the summer times with fishing, uh, fishing outings. And then uh, we kind of retract ourselves back into uh, back at a church that we meet at um, to do rod building and fly tying. So that kind of helps it kind of helps balance out the workload, but uh, having a good big group of volunteers does uh, does spread it out a little bit for everybody, and uh, you have a chance. And there's always the um, the connectivity, as Jared was talking about, that's kind of off off cycle or off meeting. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of that that goes on, and I think that's how this program kind of facilitates that connectivity. So if you're tying a fly, how long does that normally take? Uh, <laughs> how fat are your fingers? How next are you? How long That's you been right. tying? Um, usually when we do a fly tying event, uh, we'll host for two hours and the, we'll try to do two flies. And the first hour you'll, you know, probably the first half hour of that first hour is getting the first one down. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. There's flies that take me a, an hour to do. Um, just one i don't tie very many of them because i don't have the patience for that and there's others that take about you know one to two minutes so it really depends on that okay. um, but we go really slow and do step-by-step -step instruction mm -hmm. make sure we're trying to make sure everybody's on the same page nobody's getting ahead of each other because we do have different experience levels when we do classes and so usually you'll walk away with you know, four to six flies to add to your mm -hmm. box um, and two different patterns in a two-hour class okay mm -hmm. And then what about the rod building that you mentioned, Jeff? Yeah, that's uh, that's usually uh, at least a couple of weeks. Now, uh, it just depends on how often you can meet, but uh, it, there's some time that usually is required to get the wrapping down and then uh, the epoxy. And uh, we usually have a lead instructor. But I, I would say if you could really accelerate it, you're probably looking at one to two weeks uh, to put a rod together. It's, okay. and. And they're beautiful. I mean, you can do all sorts of stuff. We also have a program. It's a, a kind of a pinnacle program in the Midwest where we send eight participants uh, to Grayling, Michigan, and they actually, in a week, will build a bamboo fly rod, a two-piece uh, that they'll fish. Uh, and by the end of the week, they're out on the water with it. So it's it's yeah, really right. remarkable. You get into the planing and all that. That's a little bit more sophisticated. But if once you get through the building of a conventional rod, either out of graphite or fiberglass, then you can kind of transition then to the next level, which is uh, bamboo. And then, um, so I guess for both of you, what's the uh, biggest fish story you each have? Oh boy. <laughs> My biggest fish. Actually, I've got two, a, a tie for a tie for two, but the, the second one, the second fish was not as exciting as the first. I'm a, a saltwater guy. Uh, I kind of balanced it out. And so, I love to fish tarpon and my very first tarpon i was fishing actually with a guy that uh was the he was the host of silver king's television his name was bo basso and we were went into florida bay and it was a beautiful day glassy water and my very first tarpon was six foot and 135 pounds oh and it was really wonderful i've caught several others since that time but uh that was a great fish. I, I'll i never forget it. I could literally stick my head inside the mouth of that fish. It was that big, you know, just oh, like yeah. a giant bucket. And then, so it, I've never fished for tarpon. You can't eat those, right? They're too bony. Is that right? Do. Yeah, they're pretty, <laughs> some people will eat them. I think the way they're typically eaten is when they're little babies, they smoke them kind of like a herring. But oh. once they get up to that size, and 135 is actually not a real big female. The females will push about 180. You know, that's usually the big ones that you see. The world records, the females are bigger than the males. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's not a delicacy. And that's to some extent what protects them. You know, <laughs> otherwise, right. if we could eat them, they'd be gone. You know, <laughs> right, right. that's probably a good thing. Man. What about you, Jared? Biggest fish story? Uh, biggest fish I ever caught was also a tarpon, but I don't think that's the biggest fish story I have. Um, 
the, this uh like, uh, that walleye, right? Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Wrong side. There you go. That walleye right there. It's not even a. It's not even a trophy walleye. Um, but while I was going through my counseling through the vet center here in Columbus, they did a fishing trip, um, and my counselor knew. Uh, shout out to Jim. Knew that I was like that's how I was treating myself. And he's like, why don't you go on this trip? Like, All right. So we head up to Lake Erie and we got on the boat with probably about twenty other vets. And uh, nobody caught anything the whole day, but we had all thrown two, three bucks in for biggest fish. And uh, I think two walleye came in that entire day, and this ended up being the biggest one. And <laughs> it was the first one I'd ever caught, first time I ever gone wow. walleye fishing. And it was just, um, it was it was the start to my healing process. And so this fish uh, <laughs> behind me on the wall means probably more to me than anything I've caught since. I was hoping you were going to talk about that fish. It looked great. I noticed it in the, in the camera shot. <laughs> I love yeah. fishing for a walleye. They're fun to they're fun to land. Better to eat. <laughs> yeah, they're very good too. Um, yeah. So what? Uh, you know, a lot of people always think you can you only fish uh, you know salmon and and trout, but I think you can fish other fish with a fly rod and reel. Oh yeah, yeah. I've caught a shark, a okay. uh, carp. Oh gosh, muskies, uh, you know, there's really no limit to it. I think once people started to open up their minds about it, uh, you started to see redfish happening more often. I think a lot of that was happening before, but it was kind of quiet. It wasn't as um, high profile as a brown trout or a rainbow trout. Right. Uh, but just about any, you could, I'm, I'm seeing, I have a friend that runs um, tours in Equ uh, near Ecuador mm -hmm. and they, uh, they catch swordfish and sailfish okay. on a fly rod yeah so it's there's no there's and and as soon as you can decide that you want to target a fish somebody has figured out a fly to do it the okay. best fly i ever saw was a somebody took an old black flip-flop and cut it so it looked like a little seabird and they actually caught a giant trevally on it on a on a flip-flop they, they just oh, put a hook in it but they caught a 100 pound giant trevally because the giant trevallies eat these seabirds when they land on the water to get the fish you know so <laughs> that was the best fly ever yeah that's great i love that all right um so we're we're uh, kind of wrapping up here what it, what are some final thoughts that each of you would like to to leave with us or leave with our audience uh, my main thing is just, hey, if this sounded interesting, reach out to your local program lead, shoot them an email, give them a call. Um, worst case scenario, you know, you show up and it just isn't for you and, and you find that out. But um, there's so many veterans out there, especially in my age group, the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans that just you're too tough to need help. You're too young to need help. Um, that might be the case. You know, maybe you don't need help, but you might get some really cool free fishing trips out of it. Yeah. Um, so if you're interested, reach out. We'd love to meet you. Uh, and just, I know it takes a lot of energy to go out there and meet new people as, you know, as a veteran or just, you know, depending on what's going on with, with your individual self. Um, but we're, you know, we're the kind of group that actually can understand and is cognizant of what you might need. And so mm -hmm. we're going to be caring to that and, hopefully you know you can muster up the courage to go and try something new or go and check out your local group if you think it'll be fun okay great and jeff what about you spread the word you know let let people know about us i think uh we're still kind of quiet you know mm -hmm. there's a, we're, we're known in the veteran community we're known in the fishing circles but spread the word i think uh if, if you know a veteran that you think is in need just suggest it and see what happens uh and if there's an opportunity and you see, you see us pop up on Facebook or something, um, any little bit helps. So uh, we're always looking for donations. We look for donations of equipment. We look for donations of, uh, of money, obviously. And so just spread the word and support us. Okay. Well, great. You, you guys are running a, a super organization and it uh, clearly is having an impact. Um, I can't wait to hear this to our audience here on the fifth. Um, so thank you both for participating. And more importantly, thanks for continuing to serve and or serving our veteran community in such a manner. No, thanks thank you. We're honored us. to be here. Yeah, you bet. Um, so I've got a few final announcements I'd just like to share with our audience. Um, so on the 9th of November, we've got a whiskey tasting. Uh, so if you uh, haven't really, um, you want to learn more about whiskeys, uh, Irish whiskey, bourbon, rye, 
uh, that sort of thing, uh, check it out. We've got some veteran owned and veteran distilled uh, whiskeys that, that are gonna be featured as part of the whiskey tasting. On the 11th of November at 11 a.m. is our Veterans Day ceremony. So we've got uh, Mr. David Kim. He's the MilitaryTimes.com uh, Veteran of the Year. He runs another fantastic organization called Children of Fallen Patriots. And they meet the educational needs of uh, kids whose parents have either died or been killed in the line of duty. And uh, they've, I think, given $61 million worth of scholarships uh, since they've been founded. Uh, so they really do a great job supporting Gold Star families. And then on the 12th of November, we've got a jujitsu seminar at the museum. And we're we've, uh, featuring one of our local black belts uh, here in Columbus, but he's a world champion black belt. Um, and so we're excited to have that seminar. Also on the 18th of November, we got a painting workshop with Sean Augustin, Army veteran who's part of our new uh, identity exhibit, which is from another great organization called Creative Vets, which uses uh, art mediums, sketching, drawing, collage making, songwriting, other music um, mediums to, again, have that uh, connection, to, to be in the moment, to get out of your own head uh, opportunities. And they allow veterans to almost translate the, their experiences, good or bad, or both, uh, through uh, different different art. So it's a, a really fantastic exhibit and it in fact opens tonight. And then on the 19th of November, uh, we've got a gratitude circle and candlelight yoga with our deputy chief of staff, Jennifer Ballou. She's a retired army master sergeant, certified yoga instructor, and also a Gold Star family member. So uh, if any of those interests you, check them out on our website and uh, get involved, become a member and support uh, Project Healing Waters uh, through time uh, or getting involved or, um, you know, monastery donations to help them continue to support the cause.